Welcome to the Chevron Fab STEM Fellowship Podcast, a tour through fab labs and makerspaces across the world to learn about the best practices in teaching STEM and equitable, inclusive, engaging outreach. The Chevron Fab STEM Fellowship is a one-year discovery program for outstanding educators to learn about, create, and promote innovative and inclusive programs that teach STEM using digital fabrication and to engage new and underrepresented student populations in STEM education and careers. Our host for today is Chevron Fab STEM Fellow Nathan Pritchett from Fab Lab Tulsa. Hi, I'm Nathan Pritchett. I'm the Executive Director of Fab Lab Tulsa. I'm also one of two Chevron Fab STEM Fellows for the 2023 year. This has been a really exciting opportunity for me as someone who's been in the Fab Lab network now for uh, you know, over a decade, so it's going to come up on 12 years. I'm just always fascinated by this uh, this Fab Lab movement and, and what makerspaces mean for communities. And sometimes I feel a little siloed, honestly. So um, there aren't a lot of other Fabbers in my in my community, and so sometimes we have to get out of our community and go visit someone else to kind of experience what that's what's that what that's like. And, uh, you know, just kind of um, open up. It's kind of professional development in a way. Mm. And uh, so I've been really excited with the um, Chevron Fellowship that it's afforded me this opportunity to come to the Monterey County Office of Education and, and learn from another lab and really share our experiences. And uh, I think it's really interesting, too. We, we know that the Fab Lab Network is really diverse, right? Yes, we do. Um, but we still have some of the same experiences, whether they're, <laughs> whether they're amazing experiences or whether they're kind of pain points that we live with every day. Yeah. So, um, and I'm joined today by um, Sean True, who's the, uh, the head of the um, Central Coast Mobile Fab Lab here. And he's going to be joining me. We're going to talk about our experiences over the last three days and kind of uh, what we think. Yeah, I appreciate that, Nathan. And I think that it resonates for me what you're talking about when we talk about the diversity of the network and then also the similarities. You know, knowing what I know about the the Tulsa Lab and how diverse it is and how exciting it is and how multi-layered it is. And then we are sort of this... uh, this kind of proto version of that as we're kind of, you know, in our one room with our trailer and and out in the community and the opportunity to sort of look into the future. And your lab provides that opportunity for us to kind of see a future and understand what steps we can make to maximize our impact because we can follow behind you on that road. Even though we're, we're very different labs, we're constituted differently, we're organized a little bit differently than you are. So I'm, I'm excited. The three days have been great so far. I'm excited to, to continue our partnership because I know given the opportunity for you to be the fab fellow, you know, we wouldn't have had our relationship necessarily without that. And it is that it's a relationship that won't end at the end of, you know, our time together. It'll continue on past that and we'll continue to work together in the future. Yeah, you're exactly right. I think that that's one of the great things about the fab lab network is just our ability to share with one another and really be open and especially honest. Um, I know we're different. Um, I think it'd be worth for the listeners to kind of hear kind of where we are in our stages of development. <laughs> yeah. and, but it's really interesting because I see, I see myself in you just a little further back. But um, so Fab Lab Tulsa will kind of sell, well, we're going to celebrate our 12th year of being an open public space in September mm-hmm. this year. And so we began as an idea with a, with a group of founders in 2008, and we started for those first three years just in one, a one-room office, and we only had one piece of equipment working. We just had a laser cutter that we managed to get working, and all the rest of the equipment was in a storage unit. <laughs> Um, and then we started in a, at a 3,600 square foot space that was pretty amazing. And uh, we started building programming and building community impact and, and really kind of started to figure out who we were and mm-hmm. what was unique about us and, and where we kind of fit into our education ecosystem for yeah. our community. 
Um, and then now we're in this kind of mature stage where we actually outgrew that space. So we did a capital campaign. We moved into, you know, like the greatest fab that we could ever imagine. Um, but we're still in that growth stage, right? So we're still growing. And so what I what I visit your space and I see where you are, I'm, I'm reminded of that one room office and that kind of next generation. Mm -hmm. It's like. I'm excited for you all because I know where you're going and, and it's going to be a fun ride. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I've been with our lab since January. And I think if you, if you were going to try to sort of draw a timeline of the Central Coast Mobile Fab Lab, it has a number of starting points. We, I think we, we continue to exist in sort of that soft launch space. And what I was excited to inherit really from those who came before me was a space that we have we have more than one laser working well technically we generally have one working at a time because there's always repairs to do but you know we're we have a dynamic space with a lot of tooling and a lot of opportunity but i owe a lot to those who have kind of come before since 2019 when we really started to launch our lab you know, and MCOE was really generous with providing the space and providing the opportunity. And, you know, we're, we're constituted now under the Media Center for Art, Education, and Technology. And so, you know, you talked about the diversity of labs, right? Our lab is very much a capital A STEAM lab because we're media connected to digital fabrication, but it's been the team, that media team, who's really kept our lab moving through the pandemic, through the last few years, to where now we feel like we're, we have all of this potential energy. We have a lot of community partnerships. My experience and background is, is unique in terms of working in education. So I'm sort of uniquely suited to work in a you know, county office of education space. But we're really excited to think about how our mobility makes us nimble, how our resources make us impactful, and how the need of our community really sets us up to be successful and to fill in in spaces where you know other systems aren't able to do that up to this point. You mentioned education, mm -hmm. and you all are part of a educational focused organization. We're we're a little different. We're we're an independent, mm -hmm. but we work with multiple education organizations. And, and I'm just curious. I know it's still young, and you all are still developing these programs. But what, what kind of makes you passionate? And what are you kind of seeing that are, that are the real joys so far? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I almost want to reframe the question a little bit just to take out the so far part. Fair uh, enough. Fair <laughs> enough. And just think sort of broadly. I mean, my background is, has really been as a career educator. And it, it's interesting as we think about our roles. And my role is a little bit different than yours um, in that you, you know, you're both a maker and the sort of broader administrator of a large facility and a large staff. Um, and while I may be that someday, um, right now, you know, I'm very much you know, on the ground, you know, in front of students, in you know, working with the staff and really figuring out what that what that looks like. I think when you ask the question what am I passionate about in education? It's important to understand where I come from, which is I was a classroom teacher for years. I was a site administrator. And my, you know, my last assignment in formal public education was as an ed services director for you know, a 10,000 student school district. And so there's a lot that I'm passionate about in education. Number one being our students themselves and the opportunities that they need to be successful. But I think on a human level, I'm passionate about change in education. I'm passionate about innovation in education because I've seen for the past 30 years students who aren't able to be successful in systems as they exist 
really not getting the kinds of opportunities that they're that they're owed you know there's a promise that comes with public education and i think sometimes we fall short of that promise and our students don't get what they're after because as the world changes and it's really changed quickly over the past few years but that's that's just part of the broader context of change that's gone on really since you and I were, were younger when we think about a whole technological revolution and a whole cultural revolution that's taken place. Our students often are educated in a paradigm that maybe isn't as current as it could be. And so I think where my passion lies is in thinking differently about the systems in which students can engage and in ways that are really tangible, really project and problem based, that, um, that inherently have an authentic audience, that honor their agency, their creativity, and their mastery. And that's what kind of took me out of my old role and into my new role, because I don't think that you, you can't sort of do anything traditionally as a fab lab. Like it, we're, we are, I mean, standing on the shoulders of, of, of giants to a degree. And that's not sort of the butter up. You're, you know, you are out ahead of us, but you know, you have to, you have to blaze that new trail because the tools, the technologies, the resources, they are just different and the approaches have to be different. I agree. I think it's interesting we kind of go back to this diversity. So I came to the Fab Lab world from, from a different perspective. So I came from industry. Mm -hmm. So I'd had a career, I've always worked in high tech um, the technology side was certainly one of the first things that uh, that kind of attracted me to the concept. And uh, I'd had a, a long, successful career also with startups in the healthcare field, the telecom space, and computers and mm -hmm. software. And so that part was kind of a natural fit. But as I've matured through my professional life and my personal life, um, I've begun to see that uh, yeah, there's some things that in that education system that just don't quite mesh with the real world once you're out of school, mm -hmm. if you will. Yeah. And, and so as we started developing programs, we started thinking about, you know, are, are we teaching high value skills? Mm -hmm. Are we teaching skills that employers want? Are we teaching skills that will make our students successful both in life and in taking care of themselves and earning a living. Yeah. And, and you start to realize that some of that's missing. And, and we talked about our, our personal experiences, you know, like I went to, you know, traditional middle school and high schools in the 80s that still had some of these real world life skill components in them. We had wood shop and metal shop and automobile repair, and we had cooking and sewing mm -hmm. and all these experiences that uh, have kind of gotten away from the formal education mm -hmm. and now they've been pushed into more of an informal education role yeah but these informal programs are really really powerful and they're really important to our students and it's that's what kind of gets me passionate about education I don't come from a traditional education point of view, which is honestly one of the reasons why I was surprised when I received the uh, Chevron Fellowship, because I just assumed that someone with, you know, a long established career in education would, would likely be and have a better application than I did. Um, <laughs> but over the last decade, I've, I've, you know, I've kind of developed my own teacher swagger. Uh -huh. I've gotten I've gotten comfortable in a classroom and with classroom management, and I still may not have all the vocabulary that comes from being formally educated in that field. But I think that's okay, and I think that's okay too. In fact, our staff has sometimes talked about we spent so much time in the early days when we were developing our education programming, um, trying to make it fit into this formal education setting. Mm -hmm. So how does it fit into what a teacher or an administrator would expect? And sometimes we'd ask ourselves, maybe that's not right. Maybe we should be asking them to meet us halfway yeah. and, and adjust a little bit of what they're doing to meet what we see is what's valuable for their students. And, uh, and we've been able to do that for the most part. We still have to focus on education, we have to focus on curriculum, we still focus on objectives and goals and, and meet all those standards. Um, 
But there's something to be said about this process of, you know, teaching students how to be problem solvers, how to use design thinking, how to digitize their ideas in 2D and 3D software, how to make things that, that better prepares them for what they're going to experience when, when they leave school and, and they enter the, the work environment, mm -hmm. and, which is what we want. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, where I would jump in and, and build on the conversation um, is around this idea of engagement. You know, I'm, I'm sort of thinking, I'm holding two ideas at once here, and I'm gonna start with the engagement idea. And one of the, when we in our lab talk about our work and how we want to approach students, we center engagement as a starting point. Um, you know, there's always gonna be curiosity about what we do. People walk into our space and there's a lot of kind of ooh, ah, what is that? How does it work? What does it do? Um, because even though from our context, 3D printers, lasers, CNC becomes sort of ubiquitous and it can kind of blend in and be an appliance like any other appliance to our broader audience, there's still some uniqueness there. But you that uniqueness can only go so far when it comes to engagement. Folks need to find that thing that is inspiring to them, that thing that they wanna make, that vision that they wanna realize. And so we really start at engagement as the center of, and it centers the user because the user has to be the inventor of that engagement. Here's what I wanna do once I understand what the potential is. And I think that that, um, really divergent approach differs from a traditional classroom approach, which by necessity, you know, you talked about standards and objectives, can tend to be a little bit convergent. Mm -hmm. Like we all need to get here. Um, and, you know, it can put individuals on a singular road. And in doing that, sometimes educational systems can sit in a space where they supplant the executive functioning of the participant, the student in this case, by putting structures around them that says, this is what you must do, or this is how you must behave, or this is what the outcome must look like. And the power of the way we intersect with the maker movement is there is that identity of the maker movement, which is super diverse and yes. outcomes are where they are and you know we had a conversation yesterday where you know the idea of a right answer number one it's not singular i was just thinking that while you were talking <laughs> i was like yeah what i love to see most in a classroom is engagement mm -hmm. seeing every student um, focused and attentive and working but i i do think you're right so we've kind of for right or wrong, we develop these high stakes testing environments in formal education and where there's only one right answer. But life is, is much different than that. And so what happens when you present a student with, there's no, there's no wrong answer. In fact, there's multiple right answers. Mm -hmm. And whatever your answer is, is right for you. And so I know we talk a lot about um, social emotional learning and building student agency. And this is how you build agency. You give them the role. You give them the reins mm -hmm. to, to lead the stagecoach. And it goes wherever they want it to go, which is what I thought was so fascinating about the project I helped you with yesterday. And, and you might talk about that. But um, you know, if we truly want our students to, to have agency, to be able to become leaders and, and, to, and to drive through these things, we have to start giving it to them. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of what we see doesn't always necessarily do that. I think that's where uh, maker education specifically and fab labs, this kind of open-ended environment. It's also, you know, it, it's a mindset and it's a space, and it's a creative and innovative and, and all these things are kind of bring out the best in us yep. as, as humans and makers and creators all just kind of percolate within that environment when you when you establish it in the right way. Yeah. Yeah. And I I want to I want to kind of conjure an idea in between us right now because it's it it's it's based on a foundation of of a belief that I have, but I think that when we when we contrast the concept of failure from formal education to maker education, which I know is a, is a phrase that you all kind of you know, cleave to in your shop. I think a, 
a struggle that I have with formal education is that, um, you know, failure is sort of an endpoint in formal education. It's, you know, we've got pass fail systems, we've got fails on tests. I, I, I joke and it's a sort of, you know, a little bit morbid in the joking that we're so invested in failure in public education that we, we skip a letter in grading just to highlight it, right? Like, no one gets an E in education, but they do get an F, right? Yeah. Because we've so associated this concept of failure with lack of success. But when you step from formal education into maker education, failure is opportunity. Failure Failure is where learning happens because it's, it's an incremental step toward truth, toward reality, toward success. And, you know, we fail every day in our shop and it's, and it's good because it's an opportunity to learn and to refine because the, the pursuit of engagement sits on the other side of that wall and that overcoming is about capacity building. Yeah, I think it's interesting too that while well, some parts of education may focus on failure, um, you know, when we talk about design thinking, iteration is built into the process. Yep. So uh, failure is built into the process and so it's expected, you know, we, that's what we talk about when when companies and people are developing products, we always like to talk about the three iterations, right? So you build the most viable product, you know, the quickest thing you can get to get something working. Mm -hmm. You know it's not gonna be perfect, <laughs> but yep. you build it so that you could learn more. Uh -huh. um, so I think about some of the, the rockets we're seeing taking off and automobiles are being developed and some of these big plans. And it's like, we're building a rocket to blow it up because we can't be 100% successful on the first try at something. Yeah. So we have to build through these stages and let's go ahead and build them into our, our plan and our mindset from the very beginning. So let's iterate once, then let's take a chance to look back and see what we did well, what we struggled with, what we can improve on, and let's do it again. And mm -hmm. let's just keep doing it. And, and this is how we get these big jumps to innovation. They, they seem big, but they're these little tiny steps. <laughs> yeah, they, it <laughs> seems like it happened overnight, but in no way it happened overnight. I can go into my shop, you can go into your shop and find all of that sort of prototyping identity and reality that exists there. And you treasure these sort of, you know, sort of goofy looking objects because you understand how they led somewhere. Yeah, uh, yeah so our lab is, is located in, a, in an area of town that, uh, that has struggles. And the, the kids that we see, even though we're a very manufacturing centric mm -hmm. community, we have a lot of manufacturing jobs. These are some of the highest paid jobs in our community. Um, but in their day-to-day -day life, they, they don't see these as opportunities because they, they can't visualize themselves because all they see are service jobs. Yeah. So um, they see working in fast food restaurants and at gas stations, and they have no idea, not, not just them, their parents, their mm -hmm. guardians, their friends, their everyone that's kind of in their life. They just don't know that just down the street is, is another type of job. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that these jobs have changed dramatically. So, you know, we have this vision of manufacturing as, you know, like coal mines. They're dirty and grubby yeah. and hard. <laughs> um, in, in Tulsa, when I go into these spaces, these are some of the most technologically advanced spaces you've ever been around. Mm -hmm. And and they're, they're as clean as operating rooms, generally. Yeah. And, and so it, it's a different environment. And it and they're also multidisciplinary jobs. So it's no longer coming in, standing for 12 hours and pushing a button or pulling a lever. You've got to understand the technology. You've got to understand the software. You've got to have basic math skills and measurements. You've got to sometimes be able to work with robots mm -hmm. and, and different types of things. And so they're really fun and dynamic. And the products they're making are exciting. So, yeah. you know, if, if we're going to go to the moon, if we're going to go back, if we're going to go to Mars, if we're going to see some of this innovation that we want for our communities, whether it's clean energy or less pollution, 
these are real world problems, mm-hmm. right? So these are not uh, media problems. They can't yeah. be solved with social media. <laughs> nope. Um, <laughs> Instagram it, will not fix it. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. And so we need our young people to start learning hard sciences and we need them to start experiencing real world problems. And so they have the skill set to help us drive through some of these changes. Mm-hmm. And so if we're going to change, you know, our electricity grids and, and all these things and how we do automotive, we need, we need to start building these solutions and we need to try lots of things. And, uh, and that's kind of what we need to get them in this mindset is that that's what innovation's about. It's, yeah. it's leading to these social changes that we so desperately need. Um, I know you were, we were talking about um, impact, and mm-hmm. I, I wondered if you could talk for a moment about about the class. So I went with you yesterday, and we went. Um, I can't remember exactly middle school. You we were at Main Street Main Middle Main School Street. in yeah. Soledad, California. Yes, and and you were doing a, a board game design class, and involved. Uh, actually creating the board itself, mm-hmm. game design. I, th- I thought it was pretty interesting, some of the ideas, and 3D printing. Yep. And I wonder if you could just kind of talk about what that process was like and, and what you think the impact with the students was. Yeah, and I think I want to um, f- frame it in, in a couple of ways. And the first way I want to frame it is around equity and opportunity. When we think about the, our vision statement for the Central Coast Mobile Fab Lab, we start with our lab is an opportunity. That's what it's built on. And what we, what we find in our community, and I know it's not dissimilar to your community, is that there, there is a disparity between those who have and as a result have access to and those who don't have and therefore don't have access to. And I can't speak to the funding models for education in Tulsa, but the funding models for education in California definitely afford greater resources to schools where greater resources already exist in the community. And so being able to go into, as a county office of education, you know, our mission is about supporting our entire educational community. And so to be able to go into schools where the kind of technology that we have doesn't exist gives students who would not have access access. And it speaks to what you were talking about in terms of the vision and the perspective that students have. And so we chose games as a way to, you know, capitalize on a moment of engagement for middle school students because it was relatable. But in essence, we used games as a Trojan horse. So because our goal was, can we teach digital fabrication and how can we go about doing that? And so by using game design, you know, we started We started literally on day one with students in Tinkercad, you know, doing digital design. And we used the idea of a six-sided die as the concept that launched them into being able to do that design because it was a simple enough object. It was relatable. So the students knew kind of, okay, it's a closed-ended outcome, but there were a set of skills that were designed into that experience so that they could have success. We wanted to make sure that they had both engagement and early success. Early success is always important, especially in 3D printing. Uh (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes, early success is off, is important and challenging sometimes in 3D printing. But by doing the digital design, it was great to watch eyes light up when when they designed something in the computer and I came back 2 days later and handed them those objects. Like here it is. You made this. It didn't exist before. It was an idea in your head. Yeah, we talked about that in the drive how yeah. powerful that is that a student could have an idea yep. that no one else has ever had. It's just their own and that they can make it a reality mm-hmm. and how empowering that is for them. Yeah, and so that's, it was really about how much time can we spend in digital design. And admittedly, there, are, there were assets that students used for games that they sourced from other spaces. And that was, that was part of the work as well so that we could get them to understand that there's an entire ecosystem out there that's designed to support 3D printing. You know, I think that 
something that folks don't realize. So we'll do, we'll go out, um, you know, and and do events just like you do. We'll do events out in the community, and we'll have three D printers set up. And I had an uh, an engagement with a parent at a family STEM day not too long ago where. We're talking about the 3D printer, and he's watching it operate. And then he then he asked me, he's like, "Well, how much would something like that cost?" And I said, "Well, that printer, that printer right there, you know, is is a sub two hundred dollar unit." And he he was really taken aback, you know. And this is an adult professional. It was taken aback. He's like, "I thought you were going to say it was like ten thousand dollars." Really and, accessible. And that's the thing that. The adults in our world don't necessarily understand yet. You know, there's still digital fabrication at the industry level. It exists. It's a reality. Mm -hmm. People understand that it is the work. At the commercial level, you know, at the at the consumer level, folks are still waking up to it and thinking, "Well, it's a hobbyist thing. It's a this or it's a that." Or I don't necessarily understand where this fits into my reality, but. We help students understand there's an entire ecosystem of resources that exist from, you know, as you talked about earlier, you can find Darth Vader, but you can also find a cat food lid. You can also find that broken part for your Prius that you are frustrated because it doesn't work anymore. It's all of these things are out there short of the design space in the machine understanding space. So we live in that space as well with students when we do game design, but our ultimate goal is always going from here to the machine. I was really impressed. I was really impressed with some of the, the dice design and the symbols <laughs> they used. And I'm always interested in middle schoolers, just kind of the way their minds think about some of their, their game uh, <laughs> topics and things. Yes. So you never know what you're gonna come up with come across with a middle schooler, which is, which is always amazing, actually. Uh, and I was really, I know we talked about one particular student who just, like, has taken off. Like, I mean, not just engagement, like ownership. Ownership mm -hmm. of their 3D printers and ownership of the software. And, and every once in a while, you just see that spark. And what I think about in Tulsa is our school systems and our many of our parents can't afford the opportunities that we provide. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but what we do is so essential. Without us, with without us coming to their schools, without us coming to their after school programs, without us doing summer camps, without us having these experiences, none of that would happen. Yep. And I think about that student yesterday and. Where would he be today if you hadn't showed up? Because he was frustrated, right? He was he was at he was the quitting point, yeah. and he was going to quit <sighs> uh -huh. um, out of frustration. And we just kind of came along just at the right time to kind of save him. But now I think the spark is there, and it's going to last a long time. You know, yesterday was certainly a day where you know he was so excited that he was successful on his printer that he had gifts ready. You know, I was like, yes. look, what, look what we managed to do yes. because we cracked the code. And that code, you know, you, you can make two degree changes for a student in their life and they end up someone to, somewhere totally different than they would have been otherwise. You can also make 20 degree changes in their trajectory, 30 degree changes in their trajectory. And it's so, so different where they can end up. And he will end up somewhere different as a result of the experience. And we're a little part of that. You know, the teachers at that school set up an opportunity in a context and had the vision to put him in the right place. But what our teachers need, and that's part of our mission through the County Office of Education, is an opportunity to build their adult skill set as well. Mm -hmm. And I know that's work that you all do in Tulsa, so that not only they can see what's possible, but they have the skills to be that person for those students because yeah. it is foreign. It's not part of their teacher education programs. It's not part of their background, except for that 
one teacher on the campus who has an interest right. and if they can get like, the funding to meet interest, the interest yes. then away we go but we do need to think more at a system level and change the way things operate and build that capacity across the board because these things are going to be a toaster in the future everybody's going to have one yeah we had you mentioned the word success and it came to a thought that we've kind of experienced so we started doing assessments of our students early on, and we were very fortunate. We had partnered with um, Chan Hellman at the OU Hope Research Center, and mm -hmm. he measures hope primarily for social issues, but he started measuring hope in some of our students. And, and what it really does is it, it's a measurement of how successful you think you'll be. Like, are you able to do something? And it kind of measures that engagement. And um, what we kind of know is that these programs have successes and experiencing success makes students more likely to have another success mm -hmm. and another success. And especially in the community that we serve in Tulsa, we know that many of our students have not had a lot of successes. Mm -hmm. They have not had that kind of defining success story that, that puts them over the edge and gets them onto a track that, that we hope they'd be on. And so sometimes it just takes one, and, but it, you're right, it's, it's a building, and it's a scaffolding, it's a ladder that keeps raising them up and, and getting them further into more successful things in life. Um, but we just kind of never know where, when and where that will happen. So yeah. um, okay. one of the other things I was just kind of curious about was uh, what's been the community response? So I don't know how much interaction <laughs> you've had. Whether they, do they yeah. understand what you're doing? Is it well, just... Is it, is it shiny equipment without really getting into it? Or is, yeah, I mean, there's I that think, education model. It's a, I think it's a complicated answer when you talk about do they understand what, what you're doing. They may not understand the technical of what we're doing, but I think that I think the community has a heart and an understanding for what it is that we're trying to do. They understand the, the mission of the space. And I think when I think about our our position within the Fab Lab network. And we're, we're a little Fab Lab on the coast of California. And we see these Fab Labs that are building water systems and building houses and their approach to saving the world as a mature Fab Lab, you know, exists at, at such a tangible structural community level. And we are in a space right now where, and this is where I think our, our community really believes in us that, we want to be a fab lab that changes the world as well, but we're doing it at the personal level for our students because we, our mission is as an educational lab. And I don't think you can find a community in this country that isn't behind education for their students. And I do think that there's an understanding. We talk about post-pandemic impacts and everything, all of the upset that came through the educational system over the past couple of years, that upset provides opportunity because it change mind, changes mindset, it changes context. That's, that's kind of another thing that I think about on, you know, and, and maybe you can use this if it, if it works out, but I think this is kind of the genius of the, of the Fab Lab network is that there's enough flexibility within the model mm -hmm. that each of us can do what's successful for our own community and for our own students. It doesn't mean that we don't share similar aspirations and goals and objectives. And we obviously share, you know, principles of the Fab Lab principles mm -hmm. and digital fabrication. But if we need to make adjustments that work for us, there's enough flexibility in that model. So what works for you in Monterey County may not work for me in Tulsa and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And and so whatever it is that you need to be successful is is part of part of that model. I think that's that's pretty powerful. Yeah, when I think about you know, any any lab following me with all of the wisdom that I've gained from the very few months that I've been in the role is lean on the network because there are those who have gone before you and there's a ton of value in making your own mistakes but fear not you will regardless and there are other people who can provide guidance in areas and the questions will change over time with experience but the the a key takeaway around what to do in this space is to learn from each other yeah, absolutely well thanks sean 
Thanks for having me Thanks, out this Nathan. week. <laughs> no, it's been great. I think for me, um, you know, one of my personal kind of goals in life is to make friends. You <laughs> it's know, a good goal. It is. Well, it, you just you know you, you just go through life and you, and you want to meet great people and and have great experiences and, and make friends wherever you go. And I feel like I've really done that. Not yeah. just this week, but in the months we've been leading up. And, mm-hmm. and I, I know we have a, a professional partnership as well, and we're going to be um, partners ongoing. But I, I really appreciate you hosting me and having me out. It's, it's been a wonderful experience. And, and that's the part that I think is great. It's just these, these experiences are, are, are just amazing. The Chevron Fab STEM Fellowship is a one-year discovery program for outstanding educators to learn about, create, and promote innovative and inclusive programs that teach STEM using digital fabrication and engage new and underrepresented student populations in STEM education and careers. The program is inspired by Chevron's social investment strategy and the Global Fab Lab Network, both of which foster innovation, learning, and invention. Fab Labs, with their suite of digital fabrication tools and prototyping machines, including laser cutters, 3D printers, vinyl cutters, and milling machines, are inspiring young people across the world to learn about science, technology, engineering, and math STEM. These are safe and accessible places to play, create, learn, mentor, and invent. The fellowship awards a stipend of $10,000 to each selected educator to use toward creating and disseminating new, inclusive practices in STEM education and hands-on impactful making. The fellows will visit a few fab labs of their choice anywhere in the world to learn, to reflect, to co-create new curriculum and disseminate new practices. Their work will be published in podcasts, online blogs, and through talks and presentations at conferences and educational events over the coming year. For more information about this podcast series and the Chevron Fabston Fellowship Program, please reach out to us at cvxfabstem at fabfoundation.org.